All right, welcome. Got too many screens open here. Shut up. Hush. All right, welcome. We are on the fifth. Fifth? Part five? I think so. The next Genesis talk. This is Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. Thank you for joining me. Congrats to uh, the channel. We hit 45K. That's a landmark. It's not been a, a good past couple months with all, with all the algorithm changes. We, uh, we were sliced to half of our normal growth, which is unfortunate. So we don't have the growth that we hope to have. Hopefully that'll fix. I don't know. I don't know what they're doing with all this algorithms and whatnot. But uh, the normal growth was pretty consistently at least a thousand uh, every month, sometimes more than a thousand a month. And now we've been cut down to about 600 after all the algorithm changes. But thankfully, we're, we're still here. So that's good news. We haven't been booted. We haven't been booted. Um, we had some interesting Discord debates this week. <laughs> Today's was interesting. Um, a little bit of house cleaning first. Welcome all the nerds. I'll be sure and like and share if you would. Hit me a, give me a thumbs up on that. Smash that like. And uh, <clears throat> so we we provoked the res the statements of Stefan Molyneux, James White, and who's that other dude? Oh. Mailer Tarshall. Mailer Tarshall. <clears throat> he says, we'll go, by, we'll go through these one, one by one. So now James White, uh, Dr. James White, Dr. James White. I read James White a long time ago, and I first encountered him with his book, Forgotten Trinity, which is funny because when you look back now, the Forgotten Trinity is pretty hilarious if you know Orthodox, Trinitarian, Christology, etc. Because he's got Christological heresies in there, which is pretty funny. But um, no surprise for Calvinism to have Christological heresies, right? It's pretty much premised on Christological heresies. So the first thing, let's see, one thing I want to point out. And now in the midst of this, I don't know that... I don't even know who Francis Chan is, but I guess he was some Calvinist dude. Um, but I'm going to share you the original article 10 years ago that kicked this off. I don't know that Chan knows anything about me or he has ever seen any of my stuff. I don't know about that. But some of this is in reaction to the video that I made, apparently. That's what prompted James White to react. And that's because so many people have been sharing this video. So I don't really, I'm not sure I trust that that video only has 9,000 views because if all of these people have been commenting that it just seems like there would be more views than that. I don't know. So the first article that kicked off this stuff many, many years ago and actually led some of my friends to becoming Orthodox out of reform theology was an article I wrote about Rush Juni. And the reason that I, I link that for you is because I realized that Rush Juni was an historian. And so if you read the, the Foundations of Social Order, which is a famous book by Rush Juni, you'll notice the things that he says that uh, Cyril says out of Ephesus are actually the exact opposite of what Cyril says out of Ephesus. And in fact, when you read the Council of Ephesus, the whole argumentation against Nestorius is based on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, body, blood, and uncreated deity, right? So that's the argument that St. Cyril used. That's not the argument that I used when I was a Calvinist. So when I actually went and read St. Cyril, I saw that Rush Juni says the opposite of what Cyril says. Rush Juni is saying Nestorian stuff. He says, we don't worship Christ's humanity. We only worship his divinity. No, we, we worship one incarnate Christ in both natures. And that's why you can, that's why when Cyril argues against Nestorius, he says, Nestorius, in the Eucharist, are you eating the flesh of a man? Or do you eat the flesh of the God man? You see. <clears throat> and so the stupidity of many, of the not all, but many of the Reformed theologians uh, in terms of splitting up the worship of Christ, 
uh, is another in- instance, another example of their Nestorianism. And then the rest of James White's thing was about how I had this long exchange many years ago with, with Turretin fan. Yeah, I did. And Turretin fan had no idea about Christology, so the debate went nowhere. He didn't know what he was talking about. Uh, in his mind, just rehashing Reformed theologians on the on Nestorianism and Christology was the was his response. Yeah, I know what Reformed theology says. And by the way, I was Reformed. I know what Reformed theologians teach. I have a giant Reformed theological library in my new restored library. I've had them for many years. I went to Bonson Seminary. I know what Reformed people teach. I'm not rep- misrepresenting it. And uh, But that's the kind of stuff that James White was relying on. Oh, he says we b- believe in, we don't believe in a tradition. We do accept a kind of tradition for the canon. I know you accept that. But it's all in name. It doesn't make any sense. That's the point. So not only did I not represent, not misrepresent, I know it better than most of those people. The point is that the canon of Scripture comes to you from a historic church. And he will admit that, as many Reformed theologians admit. I know that they admit that. That's not the point. The point is that it's inconsistent when they admit that And then they turn around and say, but we don't want tradition in these other regions. And we're just going to make this exception for the canon of Scripture. And by the way, they don't even have the right canon of Scripture because they tossed out the Deuteronomy canon. Uh, And then they turn around and they'll say, but the gospel is sola fide, sola gratia, et cetera, et cetera, which those church fathers didn't teach. So they don't actually have the gospel, but the Holy Spirit guided them to have the canon correctly and to formulate the Nicene Creed. But they're also not true preachers of the gospel, right? And Paul says that if, if any man does not preach my gospel, if in the Reformed mindset, the gospel in Galatians 1 is Paul's sola fide, right? Then they're anathema. So all those church fathers are anathema, but they also were guided by the Holy Spirit to give the correct canon of Scripture, which is just total idiocy, total nonsense. That's the point. And that's why James White is a heretic, and he's not actually in the church. Uh, all I have to do is ask, what bishop is James White under? Oh, he doesn't believe in bishops. He's a Reformed Baptist. Yeah, exactly. That's all that it takes to negate all the heretics. And on top of that, I would also say, uh, read the canons of Nicaea. Right? There's 20 of them. They think, Calvinists think, oh, we believe the, the Nicene Creed and we stand with Athanasius. You don't stand with Athanasius. Athanasius would say you're a heretic. He would say you're a Gnostic and you're outside the church because you don't teach all those things that Athanasius taught that you think are heretical, like the real presence, uh, like the relics of the saints, like the Eucharist being a sacrifice, like Easter, all those things that most of the Reformed tradition rejects. That's all Athan- Athanasius was the Archbishop of Alexandria. He's the Pope of Alexandria. That's his title. And so read Canon 6 of Nicaea to see what it says about Alexander. You have no connection to that at all. None whatsoever. And they'll say, well, we do. The church could be wrong about all those things. But so you pick and choose. I'll pick that schism is picking and choosing heresy, picking and choosing which things you want. Anyway, Uh, who else? So Stefan. I didn't think Stefan would ever actually do a debate. We knew Stefan wouldn't do that. But it's interesting that, uh, and I didn't tell people to tweet. I t- tell people to tweet him. I didn't tell people to go on his stream. People do stuff. I don't coordinate everything. Uh, and, but he said, no, he won't debate because we would have a lot in common, which is true. Uh, but uh, he's going to spare me a, a, a deathly kick to the solar plexus. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's, we, we, we know that you've done what one talk in the past on, a, uh, Aristotle books beyond that. I'm not actually sure that you know anything about the history of philosophy, Platonism, metaphysics, epistemology, ontology, medieval metaphysics, all these debates. Uh, I, I, I don't think you know anything. I think, you know, Aristotle and Rand and some of the libertarian tradition, and that's about it. Well, that's not the extent of philosophy, bro. So yes, of course, that's why there won't be a debate. Uh, what does Stefan stand to gain from that? Nothing. Unless he really wants to know about, you know, Orthodox Christianity, then I think he could stand to, to learn a lot. But I'm not hating on Stefan. I'm not mad. I don't, I don't, uh, somebody says, why are you doing this, bro? I didn't do it. I didn't send him the, 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 ch- the super chat or whatever. I didn't tell him. I asked him many times if he would like to do a debate because he says openly, who will debate? Who will debate? Who will step up? I've stepped up like 20 times, <laughs> but he won't do it. Uh, that's okay. It's not a big deal. Um, 
you know, I don't, I don't dislike Stefan. Uh, I hope eventually we can have a conversation. Uh, and by the way, I don't, if he thinks he could knock me in the solar plexus, I welcome it. Please come throw your fedora odd job hat at me and cut me into pieces like odd job, bro. I welcome being corrected. So yeah. Uh, some people were like, who's Stefan Molyneux? Really? You never heard of Stefan Molyneux? <laughs> it's like the biggest philosophy channel on the on YouTube. Um, or one of. So who else? Oh, and then Taylor Marshall today did his stream. Now, Taylor Marshall, I interacted with Taylor Marshall again 10 years ago. He had no idea what he was talking about with the essence energy distinction. He quotes John Damascus in one paragraph and says, oh, we all believe the same thing. Totally ignores the other places where the essence energy distinction is talked about in multiple church fathers, as if we don't teach divine simplicity, right? Uh, so he doesn't know these things. Uh, he wouldn't debate me. He wouldn't debate Perry. He wouldn't debate anybody on a serious level in terms of orthodox theology, but he'll have this dude on who didn't know anything about orthodoxy, but he supposedly left orthodoxy for uniatism, uh, which is pretty laughable. And then his excuse is that, oh, Jay's too abrasive. Oh, right. In other words, you would lose the debate, right? In other words, you can't hang with the argument. So... Just like uh, Soydum Cooper, I mean, Jordan Cooper, the excuse is uh, he's too mean. Yeah. Uh, we have constant discussions. We just had that discussion with the atheist yesterday. Nobody's being mean, totally civil. So that's just not true. The meanness, quote unquote, uh, comes when people are being completely deceptive. You know, when people like Ibarra, well, they'll, they'll say, oh, Jay won't debate when I've asked him for three years to debate, right? So that's the kind of thing that we, we, we deal with a lot of dishonesty. And so people will do stuff and say things in the background and then they'll have a completely different face for the public. And that's the thing that we're dealing with is trying to organize these things with a lot of just, just really passive aggressive soy, just bitchy people who, you know, if they were really confident in their positions, then what do they have to wear? Like if you're going to be a public apologist and publicly defend your views, you ought to be willing to step into the ring and have your, your public beliefs challenged by anybody. Because if you are, then it shows you're committed to the truth and you don't have a fear. You're not worried about your position being wrong because you would be seeking out what's true, right? Um, and that's why I've never really been afraid of any debates is because I'm not afraid of being corrected. I'm not afraid of being wrong or finding out what's true. So, uh, Taylor Marshall, won't, but he won't debate anybody. He wouldn't debate any, any serious apologists. And, but, so, by the way, you can always say, oh, I'm too mean. I'm not going to debate Jay. He's too mean. Well, there's plenty of other people who are capable at doing uh, uh, orthodox apologetics. Why won't you debate them? Oh, no, you're going to have some goofy guy on who like went through catechumena and doesn't even know what the essence energy distinction is. And you're going to have him on as the representative of a person converting uh, out of, uh, uh, orthodoxy to being a uniate. Come on. So that was just lame disinfo. Um, but what else can you expect from Taylor Marshall? Right. Uh, I did an article by the way, completely debunking Taylor, Taylor Marshall not too long ago. Uh, just pointing out just a simple uh, contradiction in both Taylor Marshall and Denzinger on the points that Marshall was talking about. So if you didn't read that, I'll put that in the chat. Uh, just as a reminder, All right, so here is the uh, Taylor Marshall thing. If you want to see a, just an easy way to disprove his goofy, low-level ar uh, argumentation in his articles, he'll say things like, oh, the Roman Catholic Church never taught inherited guilt. Uh, no, not true, and your own Vatican uh, declaration on limbo admits that it did. So, again, these people know that they're, the reason they wouldn't win in a debate with me is because I delve deeply into the trad, that Taylor Marshall's just now getting to trad world. I mean, I, I was at the stage Taylor Marshall was at in 2005. So the reason he doesn't want to debate me is that he knows that I might have better argumentation that would lead him out of trad Catholicism because... The, the fear of every trad deep down, and I know because I was one, is that ultimately it's not right. The system doesn't actually work. 
And the problem isn't liberalism. The problem isn't the Freemasons that infiltrate the Vatican. The problem is the Vatican itself and that the system doesn't work. That's the problem. And that's the deep-seated fear of every Roman Catholic. And that's why the people who leave orthodoxy, like Tim Flanders and other people, uh, don't actually know the theology that they're leaving. Uh, they'll have a general idea of stuff. But I'll put it this way. I've known throughout, say, the last 10 years, the people that I've watched, that left orthodoxy, uh, nobody who went to Rome that I can think of, I can think of several people, none of them actually understood why the essence and energy distinction even matters. In fact, they were all people who said it doesn't even matter. So they never even grasped it or got why it mattered. They thought, oh, that's just an intellectual thing, which is not. Palamism is not a mere school of thought or an intellectual thing. It actually is orthodoxy. Right. And then when you understand, oh, actually, yeah, the you know debate with Barlium shows that you can't mess, mesh palamism with Aquinas, right? So then they, so they just get duped by things and they'll actually, most of the time, you know, they're choosing it for other reasons. They're mad about some, some thing problem they had at a church, some run in they had with some priest, some corrupt deacon or something like that. That's usually like deep down the real reasons why they're doing it. Uh, is they're sick of it's grass is greener syndrome, but I got news for you. It ain't greener in Rome. <laughs> you will find, if you want to find out the hard way, then ultimately I guess that's up to you. Uh, I did. I did that. I found out the hard way and you will find out the hard way as well. Uh, but it's very dangerous to do that because the Roman Catholic system is not just, um, you know, it's actually spiritually dangerous. Uh, look at what it has led to. It leads to Pachamama. It leads to perennialism. It leads to just the apostasy of Vatican II. So the grass isn't greener. And if you want to find out the hard way, you'll find out the hard way. Um, but you'll also find out that what I'm telling you is true. The other thing I would say, too, uh, so we had another guy, another debate today with a uh, medium-level prominent uh, YouTuber. I'm not going to name him, but he his issue was ultimately not submitting to revealed theology. Uh, his revelational, his system is based in I'm not going to name him, but his system is based in uh, basically just worshiping epistemology and modern scientism, but turning that scientism into some sort of way to do apologetics or something like that. But what I want to stress is that this, all of this is wrongheaded, okay? And it's just as wrongheaded as the Jesuit approach to evolution, okay? The Jesuit paleontologist who helped promote evolutionary theory. If you were to go and read St. Basil, I highly recommend people need to read Basil. Uh, if you want to start with St. Basil, maybe you've been introduced to the Church Fathers. Let's say you want an easy introduction to St. Basil. Read letter eight. Letter eight is a brief summation by St. Basil of what Orthodox Christianity and the, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and what theosis and what the Logi are. So all those crazy things that you hear me talk about, that you think are my cult or whatever, they're all in letter eight of St. Basil, okay? The nature-person distinction, okay? This whole letter 38 of Basil is an entire letter dedicated to the nature-person distinction, okay? Letter 234 is a whole letter dedicated to the essence-energy distinction. So letter eight, the statement on the Trinity, right? I'm looking at it right now, read it 10 years ago. The one, the mini argument for the Trinity. Oh, what, what, is that is that Jay's stuff he makes up? No, no, it's from Basil. The tradition of the church, the power of the ecumenical councils, nature person, economia versus ontological Trinity. That's all right here in letter eight. The real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Theosis. He cites the Deuterocanon. Oh, he cites the Deuterocanon, James White. And by he does that in many places, by the way. The archetypes of created things in the Logos, the Logi, all in letter eight. Now, again, I'm just saying this is an easy introduction. So why am I mentioning introductions to Basil? Well, because if you read a famous work called the Hexameron, this is Basil's work on creation. What does Basil teach about the great? Basil the great. What does he teach about creation? Six-day creation. 
And he even mentions and anticipates a kind of evolutionary theory that was taught in his day, naturalism. Does he say that we need to combine our theology with the naturalism of the, of, of the day? No, he calls it worldly foolishness and stupidity. That's the first thing he says in the second paragraph. So the first paragraph sounds like the Big Bang, like, oh, the naturalists of our day teach this. And then he says in point two, this is a stupid presupposition. It's the vanity of the Gentiles. He says, our presupposition is Genesis revealed theology again this is not thomism oh and by the way he actually says that natural contemplation even directs us to the trinity in letter eight by the way i'll read that quote in a minute but the worldly philosophies of this world he says are vain and stupid and superstitious and they're willfully blind now does that sound like theologians who want to teach theistic evolution and meld with the world. Again, this is a whole work about six day creation. The Hexameron. Now I read the Hexameron 10 years ago when I was a Roman Catholic looking into orthodoxy. And as I've said many times, I knew what Basil said because I went and read St. Basil's letters and his other works. And I would go to orthodox so-called priests, liberalists, modernists, and I would ask them questions and I would quote Basil and they didn't know it was Basil that I was quoting and they would say, I'm a fundamentalist. <laughs> so now you can start to see why I was so slow in my coming into orthodoxy is because I would go and read the church fathers and the great saints of the Orthodox church. And then when I would ask a position and I would cloak the position and say, well, what if I said, blah, blah, blah. They would say, oh, you're a fundamentalist. And I said, well, I was quoting Basil. Oh, yeah, we don't really want your kind, <laughs> you see, exactly. That's why it was such a long, hard road to orthodoxy. So I sympathize and I empathize with the people who have the problems that they have with orthodoxy even. I understand. I recognize the problems of the orthodox church. Absolutely. I dealt with them for years and years and years trying to come in. The kingdom of, of heaven suffers violence trying to get into it. So the Hexameron, and we're not here to just talk about that. We're going to get to Genesis. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to Hexameron for a reason, because guess what? My reading of Genesis that you've been hearing me do in this talk, it's the exact same readings of Genesis that Basil does. Basil will go on to argue for the legitimacy and historicity of Genesis and the Genesis account, because our presupposition and our ultimate authority in our religion is divine revelation. I just tweeted out the quote from St. Gregory Nyssa saying that we are not Hellenists. We reject Hellenism as a philosophy, not cultural elements. Okay. Basil begins the Hexameron by saying, again, worldly philosophies are vain. They're stupid. The uh, naturalism that exists in his day, he was talking to the same Dawkins, Hitchens, naturalists of his day. And by the way, the analog to theistic evolution of this time is origin. Origin taught a kind of uh, total allegorization of Genesis, you see. And what is the response of the Orthodox? Basil is the Orthodox response to people like origin, right? And yes, I know there was an influence of origin on people like Nyssa and Basil. But if you look at the quote that I shared from St. Gregory Nyssa, even St. Gregory Nyssa, very influenced by origin, says origin had multiple heresies. How stupid to try to rehabilitate Origen when his greatest student, supposedly of the Cappadocia, of the church fathers, says Origen was a heretic. This is madness. Basil says within the first few pages of the Hexameron, worldly philosophies are vain, worldly philosophies are stupid and pantheistic. Uh, they know the creation and the creator or excuse me, they know the, the, the creation and aspects of the creation, but they don't know the creator. Now, he's saying in two senses, right, Romans 1, they don't know him as God, even though deep down in their heart of hearts, they know that they're wrong. And that's what Romans 1 is about, the heart of hearts. He goes on to say that creation is an analogy for the spiritual realm. We can look to the, spiritual, to the created world as a kind of sacrament or symbol of the spiritual world. Again, this is common in orthodoxy. He moves on to discuss people like Plotinus, and he talks about how we don't accept 
Plotinus. How silly of all the clowns out there who say that orthodoxy is Neoplatonism and Kabbalah when right away this is geared towards rejecting Platonism and Plotinus. He calls their views stupid. Next he moves on to talk about the great architect of the universe. Ah, oh, where have we heard that? Masonry. And he cites Aristotle as the author of this idea of God as great architect of the universe. And that's in the second homily on the Hexameron. So notice, we're not, I'm not saying that modern science doesn't make discoveries. That's not what we're saying. We're not anti-science, right? Byzantium gave rise to universities that come from Byzantium. What we're saying is that the worldview, the paradigm that you come from, whether it's Christian or whether it's atheistic, can do science but how you ground and justify the doing of science is a different matter. That's a question of philosophy. That's a question of revelation, you see. So, again, most of the uh, objections of the people that we've seen in the last few days, whether it's James White, whether it's Taylor Marshall, whether it's atheist materialists, or whether it's so-called non-denominational Christians, uh, or Stefan Molyneux, Guess who actually responds to all these creatures? St. Basil. St. <laughs> Basil is actually a great rejoinder to all of these people, the Roman Catholics as well, because guess what? What did I, what did I just tweet out? The letter of St. Basil to Athanasius. Letter... 66 in letter 66 he says i've asked the bishops of the west for help but you athanasius it's a letter to athanasius as the pope of alexandria he says will you please fix the problems in the east and he says if you fix the church of antioch then antioch like a head of all churches will fix the entire body nothing like papism where is papacy? Where's Vatican I in this letter? Nowhere, right? So again, many, many, many examples. Uh, divorce and remarriage. Oh, where's that? Oh, that's in Basil's letters. Basil, a saint in the Catholic Church. The canons of St. Basil used in the East for many, many, many centuries. Oh, the Roman Catholic Church accepts that. Exactly, exactly. That is letter... It's the, can it's the letter that lists the canons of Basil, like where he says abortion is murder. This is the canons of Basil listed in uh, 188. It lists various heresies, schisms, the reception of various converts, the dep how to, on what basis deacons can be deposed, uh, confession, oral confession of sins, abrasion, canons related to scripture. And then as we said, again, uh, letter 234, when we go to letter 234, it discusses the energies very clearly. Letter 235 also discusses the energies very clearly in St. Basil. Um, and it talks about the analogia. So there you can see that if you understand our theology, that it's actually Basil who teaches that oral tradition is binding, uh, as he teaches in on the Spirit. Uh, it's Basil that re rejects evolution and naturalism uh, on the basis of starting with revealed theology as our starting point. That's how he begins the whole uh, work. If you see that letter eight teaches the uh, analogia on the basis of logi, if you understand that he teaches the father is the sole cause of the Godhead and that therefore we don't teach the filioque, that's why Basil never teaches filioque, uh, that's in letter 38. Again, that's the one about nature and person. Then you can see that the whole array of clown troops and heretics that come at me, they're actually refuted just simply in St. Basil. 
whether it's the Roman Catholics, whether it's the Calvinists, whether it's the non-nominational evangelical, the theistic evolutionary proponent, uh, and even the atheist is shown to be foolish, just in Basil. Now, again, when I said he cites wisdom, wisdom is a deuterocanonical book that the uh, Protestants reject. So they don't even have the same canon as, <laughs> as Basil. They don't even agree on what with Basil as to what uh, the canon of Scripture. Now, if you don't understand the greatness and importance of St. Basil, St. Basil is like the level of, Ath he's at Athanasius level for importance in terms of theology. It's basically on the Holy Spirit that settled the whole issue where some people doubted the deity of, and, and full uh, ontological status with the Son and the Father of the Spirit. Well, Basil's on the Holy Spirit is like at that level, right? He's, he, like Nyssa, crushes Eunomius and the remaining Arian arguments. So when it comes to Trinitarian theology, nobody is more important except Athanasius than St. Basil. So how ridiculous to think that you have any connection with St. Basil, Bishop of Caesarea, Bishop, your church doesn't even have bishops. <laughs> what are you talking about? Right? And the whole modus operandi is not Roman Catholic. The theology is not Roman Catholic. By the way, I have Basil's works all annotated, right? I have, I have the whole the thing annotated here, you see. And I annotated it because I wanted to point out all the different places in in Basil, where he cites things that are both contrary to Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. And so uh, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten references to uh, extra canonical tradition from Basil. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six at least statements that I noticed, seven. Um, about where he cites the Deuterocanon to prove doctrines. Okay, he's not just citing it as a literary thing, but to actually prove doctrinal points. Um, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is uh, cited. Let me see, how many times is that one? I thought I had a note on that one. One, two, three, four, five. How to do apologetics, uh, ways that are contrary to like Catholic apologetics. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine citations. Anyway, the point is that you can see that that I'm not just quote mining because quote mining is where you just pick the quote out. You haven't read the work. I've actually read the work. Okay, so I'm not just quote mining. I'm also accurately presenting it within the context uh, of the works themselves. Right. So if I if I were just going over to Catholic answers and like pulling out these little paragraphs without the whole context. Like, for example, that quote that I gave you from Basil about uh, the Roman church and how he's appealing to Athanasius, not Rome. He's appealing to Athanasius to fix the problems in the church. And he says that once Antioch is fixed, then as a head of all the churches, the rest of the body will be made healthy. Now, if I were to not say what that's about, you would think that's, a, if I were to just clip that, you would think that's a papal quote, right? I'm not saying every papal apologist does that with a church, a quote about Antioch. I'm just saying that like the, the phraseology of, oh, you glorious head of the churches, uh, uh, Antioch, right? Because Antioch is a Petrine C. It's Peter that set up the succession at Antioch, right? You would think that's a papal quote. Oh, but wait a minute. It's an, a letter from Basil to Athanasius has nothing to do with the papacy. And the only thing that comes into it with the West is that he says, oh, I wrote to the bishops of the West for help. The bishops, plural, of the West. Anyway, now uh, that's all neat and all, but wait a minute. Did you know that Basil has a whole letter on liturgy? Do you know that, well, there's the liturgy of St. Basil, but Basil made a liturgical innovation to help establish the full deity of the Holy Spirit with like liturgical amendment. And by the way, the letter of St. Basil in uh, letter 27, excuse me, letter 207, excuse me, it's actually very instructive for rigorous as well, because we see the balance 
and the economia and the basil basically saying, look, we're not Pharisees. Okay. We're not like we worship the calendar itself. We worship the liturgy itself. We're not Pharisees. We got to have some flexibility here, but at the same time, we can't have liturgical chaos. Right? So what he says is that we want to avoid liturgical, uh, Phariseeism, but we also have a tradition of a liturgy that's handed down. And this is what no Protestant has. So when you actually dive into the church fathers and read them in depth, and this happened to me as a Calvinist, you realize you have nothing in common with these people other than what's in your head. Oh, I'm mentally connected to all those people. No, you're not. Because the church is not a mental Nestorian phenomenon where you can be like mentally in a church, an invisible church, with no connection to the actual historical church, you see. Yeah, well, I just don't believe in all. Oh, but wait a minute. Basil believed that he had the office of the keys, which meant that he could bind and loose, that he could make judgments, and that he could remit and retain sins. Now, you would say that's a Roman Catholic blasphemy, if you're a Calvinist, right? That's what we thought as Calvinists. But that's what Basil says about himself. So you have to be honest with yourself and say, well, either Basil is a heretic, and he's a papist, even though he's not a papist, right? He's a orthodox papist, you know, a serper. Or you're wrong, and Basil's right. And the rest of orthodoxy is right. Again, consistently, consistently, throughout orthodox church fathers, we find the very things that we say. And the heresies of Calvinism even present in the ancient days. Calvinism is kind of Gnosticism. Calvinism is iconoclastic. All these people would call you heretics for being iconoclastic. Because you're denying ultimately the incarnation. Now I know you'll say, oh no, we believe in the incarnation. We're not. No, no. But the incarnation has logical things that flow from it. Like the Eucharist. The real presence. Again, that's what St. Cyril argues to Nestorius. His whole argument against Nestorius in the anathemas is on the basis of the Eucharist. There's no way as a Calvinist you could argue against Nestorius from the Eucharist because you don't believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. You believe in the spiritual presence, which is Gnostic, of Christ in the Eucharist. Is Christ divided? No. So essentially Calvinism, because of its invisible church doctrine, is a Nestorian ecclesiology. It's dividing Christ's body from his spiritual presence, you see. No. Irenaeus says there's one Eucharist, one body, one church, one Christ. They're all that visible bodily, fleshly unity, solidity unity there, that sacramental unity is connected to the Eucharist, which is tied directly to correct Christology and tied directly to correct ecclesiology. And Calvinism has none of those. It does not have the correct ecclesiology, does not have the correct sacramentology, does not have the correct ecclesiology or Christology. It fundamentally errors on each one of those in its confessional statements, by the way. And I know that, that this is the, the Calvinist. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't have to agree with the confession because they're all fallible. Well, they can all be right. So it's just a, a morphing thing like, oh, yeah. All right. That's the point that we want to, to, to stress with Basil. When Basil goes to Genesis, he believes in the historicity of Genesis. And we saw that in the first four lectures with the Father Sarah from Rose book. And so the exegesis that I'm giving you is exactly the same exegesis as St. Basil. It's not something I'm making up in my head. It's not my own theories. And the, the approach of Basil is a refutation of the Protestant, of the Roman Catholic, and of the theistic evolutionist. That's why St. Basil is so great. Still so great to this day. By the way, Basil and the Cappadocians are also problematic for the Oriental so-called Orthodox. They don't like those guys. <laughs> because Basil in letter 38 is very explicit about the nature-person distinction. And if that's true, then it applies in Christology as well. All right. We left off in the talk with Genesis... Nineteen, the wickedness of Sodom, 
Did you know the, uh, this is a surprise to a lot of people. Now I'm not saying that the destruction of Sodom isn't related to the de degeneracy, but, uh, the destruction of Sodom was not just about sexual stuff. Did you know this? So there's a section of Ezekiel where Ezekiel describes the sins of Sodom and the destruction of Sodom. And do you know what is listed? Now this is going to surprise you. The sexual sins aren't listed. I'm not saying that Sodom isn't destroyed because of its degeneracy, because actually Jude says, implies that it is. But there's an interesting argument that Ezekiel makes. And I'm going to test the, the chat. This is, this, is, this is worth mentioning. What is the reason Ezekiel says Sodom was a problem? And I'm asking this for a reason because it's contrasted with Abraham in Genesis 19. What does Abraham do for the angelic visitors that is contrasted to when the angelic visitors go to Lot in, in Sodom? Do you, do you know the answer? What's, what is the reason Ezekiel gives Kevin McLean? Good job. You got it, Kevin. It's because of a lack of hospitality. That might surprise you. A lot of people are, hospitality, what? Abraham is often spoken of as righteous because he was hospitable. And if you go to Hebrews, Hebrews harkens back to this as well, that, that Abraham was a righteous man because he was hospitable. He gave food and succor to the angelic visitors, one of whom happened to be the Lord. Right, And Genesis makes that very clear, Genesis 19. Two are angels, one is the Logos, pre-incarnate. Uh, and we covered in the part two lecture, how do we reconcile that with the Trinity icon? Uh, I covered that in the talk. If you want to hear part two, you can go listen to that. We covered all that. We're not going to get into all that today. Um, there isn't a, a pretty decent answer or solution to that dilemma because you're not supposed to iconographically depict the Father. right? So how do we reconcile that with the Rublev icon? Uh, well, you can go listen to part two, but so hospitality is a mark of a righteous man. And that also shows us that, you know, Abraham's faith was a living faith. It wasn't a dead faith. It was an active living faith. All right. I will turn the speaker down, Joel. Sorry about that. I don't mean to blow, blow y'all out. I never know how, uh, where to put the levels of the speakers because anyway. All right. So Abraham this, the next point that we want to get to is the intercession, right? So we covered uh, Sarah, Sarai last time, Sarah. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting with, at the gate of Sodom, and he saw them, and he rose to meet them, and he bowed with his face towards the ground. And then he said, Behold, my lords, turn into your servant's house and wash your, rest and wash your feet. So Lot is still a righteous man. We know this from, from, from Hebrews, that Lot gives the same uh, hospitality. But if you recall, Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we know that in God's omniscience, God can see all things, but he has deemed, and this is a theme that will come up later in Scripture, to include his saints in the, what's called the Divine Council. So every day somebody asks me about Dr. M Michael Heiser's book and his essays on Divine Council. Yes, I read it. I read it 10 years ago. I know about it his essays many years ago. Uh, yeah, that's a biblical principle of the divine council. There's nothing wrong with that. It fits perfectly with the celestial hierarchy of Dionysius. So yes, we would affirm something like that. But the beginning of this inkling that we see of the divine council is that God has deemed in a conciliar fashion to include the saints and the angels in his governance of the universe. And wow, what an honor to be able to be included in that council. And that's true for all of us, right? Prayer is a participation in that divine council. So, yes, God could, as a, you know, direct divine agent, determine and, and do all acts that he wanted to do if he wanted to, but he's chosen also to have and create secondary agents and secondary causes that participate in his governance of the universe. So angels, as we know, there are nine choirs of angels, right? We know that from scripture and from tradition, from the liturgy, from Dionysius. Uh, the celestial hierarchy, ecclesiastical hierarchy, etc. St. Germanus uh, of Constantinople's commentary on the divine liturgy. We know that there are these hierarchies. 
And so God has created the universe to be governed not just directly by him, but also by his angelic hierarchy. The angelic hierarchy is part of the church. They're part of the heavenly Jerusalem. And so when we are converted and saved, brought into Christ, we are in that same church with them. That's why in the liturgy, the deacons, etc., they represent the angels. Because the angels are participating in the heavenly liturgy, as you see in the apocalypse. So what I'm getting at is that Abraham interceding for Lot is the role of an intercessory prayer person. I don't mean this in like a goofy even, a little bit of intercessor. An inter but I mean, they're kind of on the right idea, the evangelicals are when they talk about intercessory prayer, because in the Bible, yes, the saints do have that role. Amos does this, right? Amos does the same thing Abraham does, where he's interceding for the city. In, the, in that case, it's, it's Israel. And so it harkens back to, to uh, Abraham because Israel is being awful. They're acting like Sodom and Gomorrah. And Amos is interceding for them. And God says, I was purposed to destroy them in an anthropomorphism, he says. Uh, but now that you have interceded for them, I will not do it. Now, God from all eternity knew that Amos would intercede for them. So ultimately, God, in his providence, included Abraham or Amos's praying as the means by which it would be spared. Israel would be spared destruction in Amos. Here, it's the same situation with Abraham. And God grants as Abraham sort of uh, uh, haggles him down to, well, what if there's 10 people? What if there's five people, right? And so he doesn't want his nephew, he doesn't want Lot to be destroyed. Now, another thing we need to point out is that the, the uh, every Orthodox person, this is quite funny because... We pointed this out in the past with the modernists and the people who don't like the idea of uh, events in the Old Testament actually being real events and historical. They call you, oh, you're a fundamentalist. Now, every Orthodox person will tell you that one of these angelic visitors is a theophany, is the pre-incarnate Christ. One of those pre-incarnate visitors destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Here's the Jesus that they don't want. Jesus is love, man. He's like your buddy, dude. He's like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I was, I'm, I'm doing an analysis, for example, of Holy Mountain. And it's, it's very difficult to watch. And I don't mind weird movies, disturbing. I love David Lynch. So I can watch disturbing, weird stuff. But dude, Holy Mountain is a whole other level of disturbing. And... I don't even, shouldn't even be watching it, but I'm watching it because so many people have said, dude, like, what do you think Holy Mountain means? Well, you should do, like, analysis of that because it's got, like, goats and, like, symbols and sigils and it's, like, alchemy dude and Jodorowsky, man. And it's total goofiness, right? I mean, there is some ritual magic symbolism that we do need to decode. And it does have some pretty wild predictive programming stuff in it, like the future smart city stuff. I'm not recommending you watch Holy Mountain. It's gross and it's blasphemous. Very disturbing, hard to watch. But it makes me think of hippie Jesus, who is not Jesus. <laughs> like, where does this even come from? I don't even, it's modernist scholars, I guess. The real Jesus was an itinerant, you know, wandering hippie dude, right? And every boomer who's like a Vietnam vet, QAnon boomer, like he thinks that, oh, you know, Jesus, man, he was like a, he was a freaking anti-war dude, right? Like Boomer Garcia, Jerry Garcia. This is I have in my, my mind this character, and we call him Boomer Garcia. And he's like the quintessential boomer, pot smoking dude, anti-war kind of, you know, this kind of guy. Well, you know, like Jesus, man, you ever watched the uh, Holy Mountain by Jodorowsky? You know, it's like I remember when I was out there fighting the Viet Cong, you know what I mean? We were puffing some really fat ones, and I was, you know, I just realized one night, man, like uh, we're supposed to be fighting for America and all that, but like Jesus was walking around, and he taught peace and love, man, and it's like what are we even doing as a Christian country, man? Right? Just boomer-level stuff, right? Vietnam boomer, <laughs> Boomer Garcia. That's what the people think of Jesus as. Oh, but wait a minute. Actually, the biblical Jesus is a destroying angel who, who destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> now, that's not all he does, but that's part of the revealed theology of Jesus. Now, the same thing, I pointed this out when uh, we had a dispute a year ago with some of these people who 
modernist so-called orthodox saying, oh, it's the angel of the Lord in Exodus. That's Jesus. It's Jesus. And then I asked them, if that's Jesus, then that same angel of the Lord cleanses the promised land with the Jews. Do you believe that? Uh, uh, <laughs> because, of course, they want to deny the cleansing of the promised land. Right. Which totally inconsistent. Total, just total inconsistency, right? Anyway, so the Jesus of Genesis 19, who is the, the, the theophany here is the pre-incarnate Christ, is not hippie Jesus. Well, you're, you're a fundamentalist, man. <laughs> okay, boomer. And this, but we, we can admit the story is crazy, all right? This is a crazy story because... Lot, Lot is a little overly hospitable, <laughs> and if you've read the story, then you know what happens. Uh, maybe for the sake of YouTube, I, I can't mention all this story, but Lot essentially uh, knows that the um, w w the village people, <laughs> the village people who come knocking door to door, we get the impression that these village people do this regularly. I don't know exactly how. Lot got around this, but somehow he did. He was the uh, a leader there somehow, um, and he was like the one dude who wasn't involved in the midnight tomfoolery, uh, door knocking village people stuff. Macho, macho man, and yes, I mean village people in that double sense. The village people of Sodom, knocking, saying, "Hey, we heard you got a visitor there. Let us initiate that visitor." And yes, it's that gross, right? But Lot is hospitable, and so he is righteous. But in order to avert the crisis, and by the way, the reason that he's giving his daughters is precisely to avert the destruction of the whole city, you see. So Lot is reasoning like, oh my gosh, these village people, Probably the dude with the tomahawk, right? They're, I mean, with the headdress. They are going to try to have butt fun with the angel of the Lord. And that's not going to go well. So in order to at least try to save this city, I'm going to say, um, will you at least have my daughter here? I'm not saying it was the best thing to do. I don't know. I think Lot was motivated by at least trying to save the city, right? Like give them something to get them to go away so that they don't have the whole city destroyed. They do that and they want. So Lot's plot actually doesn't really work. Uh, and then it leads to them demanding the visitor. And so this leads to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I would say this is a real event, okay? Uh, we have to, the New Testament, Jesus says, remember what Jesus says? Do you think the sinners in Capernaum were worse than those in Sodom and Gomorrah? He says, no, Sodom and Gomorrah will rise up in judgment and condemn this generation. So the, the, the sins of the Pharisees and people in Capernaum we're worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus says. That's pretty wild. <clears throat> and again, the sin is not just lower region degeneracy. The sin is inhospitable. I would say it's pretty inhospitable to show up and say, give me your butt. Uh, you have foreign visitors, please hand their butts to us. And if you don't, we will kill you. That's the level of inhospitableness <laughs> that this degenerate society had come to. And by the way, this is the model for the city of man. Remember the Augustinian typology and model that we've been mentioning from Genesis 1. The city of God is present. The church is present through these phases. Lot, who is still a member of the city of God, the church, unfortunately, he's in this terrible worldly city. We're saying the church is a spiritual city here. 
uh, lot, uh, this does not go well. And so Lot speaks to all three men, however, but he prays to the Lord in particular, which shows us in 1918 that one of them is the pre-incarnate Logos, the Theophany of the Lord himself. Uh, Jesus gets rid of Sodom and Gomorrah, okay? So all modernism is thereby uh, completely canceled by that alone. And anybody who wants to say that they're quote-unquote orthodox, now you have a problem because Jesus reads this event as historical. Now, what happens when the modernist so-called orthodox person is presented with that fact? Oh, well, I guess the New Testament text where Jesus says that, that's not actually Jesus saying this. Now they're full-on higher critics. You see the steps, the logical steps. And yes, it's a logical step because I've seen countless people do it. This is the route they go down. All Why? All to deny that the Old Testament just actually happened. Why don't you just affirm that the Old Testament actually happened? All the church fathers do. Well, it goes against modern sensibilities, and we can't really we can't really expect the world to take us seriously if we say that the flood happened or that Sodom and Gomorrah happened. Who cares? What did Basil say about the wisdom of this world? It's foolishness. Why are you trying to capitulate and water things down to people who already hate your view anyway? And by the way, they're idiots. And the Bible says they're idiots. They're fools. The wisdom of this world is foolishness, Paul says. Oh, Paul's a self-righteous Pharisee. He's calling people foolish. Paul's so mean. <laughs> Jay, why are you calling people foolish? Why are you calling people foolish, Jay? You can determine which apologist that is. Uh, all right. Now, the interesting story of the pillar of salt. And by the way, the Orthodox study Bible admits that it's Jesus, right? By the way, in uh, 1921 here. I always like to point that out because uh, you can just, like if you're in an Antiochian, it was mainly Antiochians that helped put together the Orthodox study Bible. If you're in an an Antiochian church, you can always just, point out if somebody espouses this sort of liberalism be like uh well uh, the study notes in the orthodox study bible say that it's jesus who's basically destroying sodom and gomorrah oh well yeah it doesn't really mean that you know that me oh but but you're going to use these texts to prove that jesus is a pre-incarnate theophany but then when we talk about this pre-incarnate theophany destroying sodom and gomorrah oh no it doesn't really mean that that's not really what happened okay yeah whatever dude real consistent there um so uh, during Lent, the church sings, this is an interesting note, we should point out the liturgical context as well. Oh, my soul, flee like Lot to the mountain and take refuge in Zoar before me, before it is too late. Flee from the flames, my soul, flee from the burning heat of Sodom, flee from the destruction of the fire by God. Now, there's also another significant portion of uh, so-called orthodoxy who says that God doesn't even do chastisements and punishments or judgments within history. Excuse me? Really? So it's not the theophany that's destroying Sodom and Gomorrah? Uh, Father Romanides, hello? Can you in any way reconcile what you say with this? No, sorry. Uh, Totally contrary to the whole Romanides project. And by the way, Basil says many times over that there is a positive attribute energy of justice that God enacts all the time. So Father Romanides is completely contrary to what Basil says over and over and over many times in the letters. And obviously God is enacting a chastisement. If you don't want to use the word judgment, okay. It's still a chastisement, which is a, for all intents and purposes, the same thing. Because the city is wicked. Even the notes here say, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is a warning to the ungodly concerning the entire world and the final judgment. Yes, it is a type of the end of the world. What does Jesus say? The last days will be like Noah, like when Lot left Sodom. Jesus likens that period to that. Now, in the immediate context of what Jesus is talking about, he's talking about the apostles leaving Jerusalem because of the 70 AD destruction that's coming. We know that for beyond any shadow of a doubt, all the Eastern Church Fathers, for the most part, teach partial preterism. They teach that the events of 70 AD are a type of the end of the world. So Jesus is saying that 
you, my followers, I will lead you and direct you at the time when it is appropriate to flee Jerusalem, right? When you see Jerusalem surrounded by enemies, you, people before me, you know that its destruction is about to come. You flee to the mountains and pray that it's not on the Sabbath. Hello, that's the first century people. That's not talking about John Hagee's church 2,000 years later. So that is like Lot leaving Sodom. That's why John in the apocalypse likens first century Jerusalem to Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, spiritually, this city is spiritually Sodom and Gomorrah, the city where our Lord was crucified. There, he tells you right there what he's talking about. Israel had become Sodom and Gomorrah and Egypt. That's why Amos and, or excuse me, Hosea says that Israel has become the whore. Israel has become Sodom. Israel has become Gomorrah. Israel will be divorced, Hosea says. How is that possible? Orthodox theology solves how that's possible, and yet the promises are still true. So we see then, as the liturgy instructs us, that the fleeing from Sodom is a type not just of the end of the world, not just of the apostles fleeing the destruction of Jerusalem, but also ourselves fleeing our own personal sins, our past life of living in degeneracy and sorrow. The liturgy is instructing us in all those, and the church fathers instruct us in all of those. Right? These are the levels of hermeneutics that we do in Orthodox. And, by the way, uh, interesting, uh, useful study note there in 1924, St. Athanasius, St. Basil, St. Ambrose, and St. Hilary all identify the angel of the Lord that's destroying Sodom here as Jesus. <laughs> there you go. Oh, you're being a Protestant, bro. You're being a Protestant. Yeah, I'm being a pro. Oh, then, then I guess Athanasius and Basil and Ambrose are Protestants. Come on, this is crazy. Now, Lot's wife then is emblematic of the person who begins the path and then stops. And this is very unfortunate. We do meet people quite often in life who maybe there's a God. Oh, maybe I'll be a Christian. Oh, maybe I'll come become Orthodox. Oh, maybe this is true. And then, nah, whatever. And they go back, right? It's unfortunate. It happens very much like the uh, parable of the, the seeds, right? The, the, some of the seed falls on rocky ground. It doesn't sprout up. Some of it falls on dry ground. It sprouts up for a little time and then it withers away. Same idea with Lot's wife. Lot's wife was like, uh, we're leaving our fancy cottage with the village people. Uh, she looks back and she's turned to salt. This is an, a, a judgment, a chastisement that is a warning to all of us. Clearly, like, like that event is pretty obvious in what it means, right? <laughs> like, don't go back to the evil stuff. Abraham rose in there early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land, the plain, and he saw, behold, a, a flame was ascending from the whole land, a, sm a, a smoking, fiery furnace. So it came to pass that God had wiped out all the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham, and he sent Lot out of the midst of destruction when the Lord overthrew the cities where Lot had dwelt. And then we get the, the, the sons of Lot. Um... Lot with his two daughters went up from Zoar and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave with his daughters. Uh, now the firstborn was to the younger. Uh, the fa our father is old, therefore, and so, yes, there is an instance here of incest, and Lot's daughters commit incest, right? So they wait until he gets drunk, passes out, and they commit incest. And this gives rise to Moab. The younger, uh, the older son is Moab. The younger son born uh, of this incestuous is uh, Ammon. 
So these are the Moabites and the Ammonites to this day. Now, uh, once again, we see the uh, emblem of these mm, improper unions giving rise to people who will be the enemies of the Israelites. So again, at this time period, there's a closer link between the spiritual and the biological at this time period. That's not to say that in our day, it's never the case. I mean, we, we have people in our day where a priest in the Orthodox Church gets married, has kids, and hopefully most of the time those biological descendants of him are Orthodox. Perhaps they will even be priests. So we don't completely divorce spirituality and biology. Uh, if a head of a household converts to Orthodoxy, the whole household can be baptized, right? We do infant baptism. This is what you see in Acts. So we're not totally atomistic individuals, uh, but we also do understand that since the covenant has now been opened up, it's not the church is no longer linked primarily to a biological lineage of people, which at this time it was. Yet even at this time, there were converts. You could still convert in the Old Testament period to the true God. There was the portico of the Gentiles when they would do the feasts in Israel, Jews could come into the inner portico. Only the Levites and the priests could go into the, the temple, and then only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. So there's these layers, right? But Gentiles could still and did worship the true God. They could only come to the outer portico of the, the, the temple. It's called the portico of the Gentiles, right? So we know that there were still, even in the Old Testament, there were converts. So it wasn't strictly biological even then. But there was a more of an emphasis on the biological component of the church at this time, because that's how God designed it to be at this time. Why? So that the Messiah could be born of this lineage. The whole reason for all that, the Jewish genealogy and lineage stuff, and the protection of the Jewish people, was so that they could give birth to the Messiah. That's the whole purpose. It wasn't because they had magical Jewish DNA. That's not why. But the enemies of Israel also at this time do have a biological component as well. In particular, these bizarre unions, which are incestuous and unfortunate, but they also speak to us spirit, uh, of a, of, in a mystical sense, you could say, of people who come out of the church in bizarre incestuous unions, namely the heretics and the schismatics. And that's exactly the way the church fathers will spiritually interpret the Ammonites, the Amalekites, right? Doesn't mean that, that oh, that, that never happened. They weren't historical people. No, it does. But typically in the church's exegesis of the enemies of Israel in the Old Testament, for us, they represent heretics and the schismatics, the enemies of the church. So Taylor Marshall and Stefan and James White, that's the Moabites and the Ammonites to us. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm joking a little bit, but I'm also not joking a little bit, right? They are the spiritually incestuous offspring, you could say. And if you want another version of that, uh, which, by the way, is the, the consistently the patristic exegesis as well, uh, if you read Proverbs and you read the uh, Proverbs 7 like 1 through 7, and then 8 and 9, uh, you'll have two women contrasted. And one woman calls out in the streets to come to her banquet of bread and wine, namely she is wisdom, and she calls out to the Eucharistic banquet, that's the church. The other woman is the whore who calls out to a false banquet, and spiritual destruction. Those are the heretics and the schismatics. That's how all the church fathers interpret those two women in Proverbs. And by extension, they will consistently do that throughout the Old Testament. Go listen to my talk I did on Judges, where you have, I think it's Judges, was it Judges 18? Judges 17 or 18, the chapter of the weird cult that starts uh, in Israel in the days of the Judges. Remember that? This dude and his mom start a church. <laughs> it's great, though, because that whole chapter is actually 
how all the heretics and schismatics do. They do the exact same thing because it's why the same spirits impelling the same people. Um, how to identify cults and false religions, I think is how I titled it. And that is Judges. Seventeen and eighteen. So there's this guy named Micah, and he just starts his own priesthood with his mom. He's like, he's like incel Israelite. <laughs> he starts his own priest, his own religion with his mom. I'm not joking. And then he like he makes his own vest. He like sews his own vestments. <laughs> he's starting his own cult back then. Uh, it says in verse seven, and he made verse five. He made an ephod and his own idols. And he consecrated his own sons to be priests. So he's setting up a rival priesthood in contrast to the Levitical priesthood. So it's an emblematic presentation of a schismat. Now you say, now wait a minute, where are you getting this crazy exegesis? Where are you getting, you don't do that. Nah, go to the New Testament. What does Jude, what does Peter do? They take the stories of the rebellions in the Old Testament. Nadab and Abihu. Uh the people who uh, 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 argued against Moses and the ground opened up. Remember that? They're applied in the New Testament epistles to the heretics and the schismatics. So J Jude basically is a great overlooked letter because not only does Jude... Uh, refer back to these things that I'm telling you about and give you the exegesis that I'm giving you, the false teachers. It uses these Old Testament stories of these schisms in Israel as types of the false teachers in our day. Well, in his day and then in our day. And by the way, Jude refers to Sodom and Gomorrah as really happening. And then it goes on to say, now uh, let's talk about the false teachers. Who are some of the types of false teachers in the Old Testament? The first one mentioned is, well, Satan. Uh, and then it mentions Cain, and then it mentions Balaam. Now, Balaam's going to be a really fascinating story when we get to Numbers. But we haven't got to Numbers yet, but he's a great emblem of a, a false teacher. But it's uh, the rebellion of Korah. It's Korah who rebels against Moses out of envy, right? Because God had anointed Moses and Aaron and then Korah basically starts a schism in Israel and gets a big chunk of people to follow him and says, why do you get to tell us what to do? We should be telling ourselves what to do. And that's the emblem of all rebellious schismatics. They won't listen to the church and they won't listen to the wisdom of the fathers and the saints. They want to do it their own way. And they'll go against all of history and they'll go against all the councils of the church fathers and they'll say, oh, I know, I know better. No, you don't. And you're just like Korah. And Balaam. So, my point is that Jude will do both exegesis that I'm proving to you, the exegesis that's correct, which is to not deny the historicity of the Old Testament events and text, to say that they're real, and then when they do the spiritual application, it's based on the actual events happening. So, Sodom and Gomorrah, Korah, the rebellion, Balaam, they're all read in Jude to be historical events, not made up allegories. The spiritual allegorical sense of the text is based on what happened in the, hist the historical events. Clearly. And that's how the church fathers read it. I mean, I think what one or two talks back, I read you the quote from Cyril saying that St. Cyril says, we don't deny the historicity. He says the mystical sense is based on the historical sense. How long have we been going? This is going on for a long time. we got 231 nerds. Welcome. What's up? Hope you guys are enjoying the Genesis Talks. Uh, feel free to support with those Super Chats. I'll read those here in a bit. Got some nice Super Chats there. Thank you guys very much. Much appreciated for that support. Uh, this is an interesting note. I didn't know this when we come to chapter 20. Now in, in Hebrews 11, Abraham is called a so sojourner, right? Because his, his true city is not even in Palestine. His true city is heaven. 
And it says Abraham was a sojourner because he waited for the city which has foundations, right? Um, in uh, 20 verse 1, he's called a sojourner, and this is what Hebrews makes use of to talk about Abraham as, as emblematic of the true Christian. And it says that the creed calls this city the world to come, right? As we were citing the creed, Abraham believed that he would be raised from the dead. He believed in the resurrection. And by the way, Jesus and Hebrews will cite the instances of Abraham and his actions that, that prove that Abraham believed that he would be resurrected. So in other words, Abraham believed in the resurrection, which Jesus uses this to refute the Sadducees who deny the resurrection. So Jesus is proof texting from the Old Testament and thus, Abraham has to be a real historical character, and Jesus believed that he was a real historical character, as we see from those instances, obviously. Well, he's God, so obviously he did that. But this refutes all the modernists. How could Jesus refute the Sadducees on the resurrection if Abraham wasn't a real historical person who believed in the resurrection? Now, what we see, by, by, before I get to, we'll, we're going to see a repeat, by the way, of the event with Pharaoh, with Abimelech. Remember what happened with Abraham going down into Egypt as a type of what will happen in Exodus? This exact same thing is going to happen, a recurring pattern with Abimelech. But what I want to mention was that the city of Gerar was not Abraham's true city. It was given over to idolatry. The, Gentile, the, the Gerarites worshipped the god Dagon, as we learn from 3 Kings 5.2, and the goddess Ashtaroth in 3 Kings 31.10. But when the Son of God became incarnate, the word in the gospel went out to Gerar, and idolatry at that place was destroyed. A church and a monastery have actually been established there. One of its bishops was named Marcion, not Marcion, the heretic, but Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-A-N, who actually attended the Fourth Ecumenical Council in Chalcedon. Truly, this city did eventually embrace the faith of Abraham. Isn't that fascinating? So... What Abraham is experiencing here in Gerar, many, many years later, will actually have a bishop who will attend the Council of Chalcedon. Amazing. I didn't actually know that until I read that note. See? That's fascinating, though. So Abraham sojourns amongst the Gerarites. Uh, Abraham said to Sarah's wife, uh, let's do the sister routine again. <laughs> like, pretend to be my sister. And so Abimelech, king of Gerar, says, dang, your girl's hot. Now, this is interesting because Sarah, Sarah must have, because she, Sarah's old, so I don't know if they were just hard up and thirsty or Sarah was like super hot. I don't know, but maybe because we're, we're closer to the time of Eden still, maybe you could be hot and be 90 or whatever. I don't know. But then God came to Abimelech in a dream and said, indeed, you are a dead man because you have taken Sarah. So again, I will curse those that curse you and I will bless those that bless you. Now, Abimelech had not yet come to know her and he said to God, Lord, will you destroy an ignorant and just nation? Did he not say to you, she is my sister? Uh, did she not say that's my brother? For I did this thing with clean hands and with a righteous heart. Clean heart, righteous hands. Then God said to Abimelech, Yes, I know that you did this with an honest heart, and I spared you that you might not sin against me. By the way, Calvinists Calvinists believe that every action is attainted with sin. How could Abimelech say this? How could God say this to Abimelech if total depravity is true? Oh, that's because total depravity is not true. This is actually a great uh, anti-Calvinist text here because uh, this does not fit with the Cal Calvinist anthropology. God should actually be saying, oh, no, but every action that you do is done with a dirty heart and an unrighteous hand, and you're a pagan, so therefore you can never do anything right. Uh, oops. But no, um, God says, I know that you did this with, in, with right motives, and I spared you. God's saying that providentially, providentially, he spared Abimelech from falling into sin. Now, notice the compatibilism here in this text. Chapter, chapter 20 is a great anti-Calvinist text because we see, I know Calvinists affirm compatibilism, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that the actual mechanics of how this goes down is not that Abimelech is not doing his own willing with his own energy. He has a natural energy proper to him, all humans do. But that God is saying that providentially he kept him from falling into sin. 
And had he done it, it still would have been his sin. And so God goes on to say, therefore, uh, the man that you took this wife from, he is a prophet. Uh, and I will ordain that he intercede for you and then you will live. So now God could have just, if he wanted to, forgiven Abimelech. But again, God has chosen to include his people, his saints, in that role of intercessor. So Abraham, by God's intention, has to intercede for Abimelech, you see. And this, of course, harkens to, this is an image of the church, right? Protestants will say, I don't need no church, evangelical, so I could just, just me and Jesus. Yeah, but God has ordained that you come through his appointed people. Yes, God could, if he wanted to, just directly forgive sins. Yes, he can do that. But the normative means that he's appointed for that is the bishops of the church who can remit and retain sins. That's why God tells Abimelech, I will forgive you, but you have to go ask Abraham to pray that I will forgive you. Abraham is the intercessor. Abraham is, in a sense, prophet, priest, and a kind of king, right? He's one of the few people in the Old Testament who comes close to the roles that Jesus will fulfill. Now, he's not close to being Jesus. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the threefold office of prophet, priest, and king, which... Not many people come close to having all three. Moses comes close. Abraham comes close. Uh, Solomon comes close. Because Solomon actually at one point offers sacrifices. But technically, nobody is fully prophet, priest, king until Jesus. So Abimelech rose up early in the morning and he called his servants and he said all these things that he had talked to God in his dream. Abimelech called for Abraham and said, uh, what have you done to us? What did I do wrong to you? Why have you brought this on me? Uh, and Abraham, Abimelech said to Abraham, what possessed you to do this? And Abraham said, because I thought that the worship of the true God is not in this place and you're a bunch of pagans. So you will just kill me and take my wife. But indeed, she actually is truly my sister. She's not technically a sister. They're like distant, right? Relatives. So, but indeed she uh, is my cousin, more or less is what he's saying. She is the daughter of my father, but not my mother. And she became my wife. So Abraham is kind of like reasoning in a technicality, being cunning. Many of the saints are actually pretty cunning. You'll see this throughout the Old Testament. Um, Judith is very cunning. Now God calls me to wander from my father's house. I said to her, this righteousness, uh, shall you do for me in every place that we go say that that i'm your brother then abimelech took 1000 pieces of silver sheep oxen male and female servant and gave them to abraham and restored sarah his wife to him then abimelech said to abraham see my hand is before you uh, you go live wherever you want then sarah said behold i have given your brother 2000 pieces of silver which will vindicate you with honor before all those things but tell the truth in all things so Abraham prayed to God, and, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his servants. Then they bore children, and the Lord closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So blessings and cursings, uh, cursings uh, positives and punishments come. And we have Abraham and Sarah becoming a witness. They're actually witnessing and preaching the true God even to Abimelech. And this is another thing you'll see, you'll see too throughout the Old Testament is that the patriarchs, the prophets, Jonah, right? They will at times also preach and attempt to convert pagans because Abraham is a convert. Remember, a Abraham comes from a household of idol makers. So his father was a pagan. Now, next up uh, will be part two. I'm going to go ahead and call it uh, a close here because we're going to get into the birth of Isaac. And Isaac is a miraculous birth, right? We have the uh, aging Sarah here who laughed when she said that she would, when God said, I will uh, cause you to give birth. She said, <laughs> how is that possible? And then the name Isaac comes from laughter. So God says he will be called Isaac. And I'm going to do this because it's a miraculous sign 
because this is all pointing to a miraculous birth in the future. Wonder what that is. Well, you know what it is. Jesus. All of these miraculous Old Testament births are obvious signs that the Messiah will have a miraculous birth. Now, I wonder how many of those messiahs there are to choose from. Hmm. What messiah claimant had a miraculous birth? Hmm. Could it be Jesus, maybe? Yes. So, again, over and over and over, we'll see all these instances of types and signs that are supposed to signify prophetically this coming Messiah that will fulfill all these co covenants, types, and promises. And then with uh, uh, Isaac, we will get to the ever-loving favorite claim of the atheists. Human sacrifice. Why does Yahweh demand a human sacrifice of Isaac? Gotcha, theist. Booyah, BTFO. Well, actually, we're going to see that the story of Isaac is an apologetic treatise against human sacrifice. <sighs> Blew your mind. How are we going to say that? Well, that'll be in part two. Uh, so actually, it's a powerful apologetic, just as we'll see with Exodus, the Exodus motif. It's an apologetic against all those gods of Egypt. Bet you didn't know that. Now, some of you knew that. but And in the same way, the situation with Isaac is actually a apologetic against human sacrifice. Contrary to what the Fedora people think. All right, so time for Super Chats. And remember, if you want to hear the rest of that, Genesis 21, 22, uh, and then probably 23, because 23 is a short chapter about the death of, uh, of Sarah. Uh, you'll want to go over to part two, where we'll cover all that. And guess what? Surprise, surprise. The offering of a son. Yes, obvious typology with Isaac of Jesus, clearly. Uh, but we'll get to that in part two. But my head, I've talked so much today. We had hours of debate earlier. Like, my mind is turning to mush. So if I don't stop now, I won't be able to answer the questions. Paul, uh, Philip Edenhorn, welcome. We got a new member. And by the way, for people that have uh, joined on YouTube, uh, remember, it's the same content. But if you joined on YouTube, uh, I just put the tragedy and hope lectures in the community tab so all eight of the tragedy and hope lectures the full talks are there available which a lot of people have been requesting those so now you can access those in the community tab if you're a member nathaniel hill 13 dollars. did you get my brosive did you get my email uh i hope the move went well thank you for that um i am moved in i should be able to catch up on emails and i apologize i think you messaged me last time and i still wasn't caught up on emails so there's a probably still about 50 emails i haven't got to uh, and every day there are like, it's just piling up and piling up and piling up. And Jamie has helped me in the past with a lot of these emails. So I still, I'm gonna have to en enlist her again <laughs> to help me catch up on these emails because it's just, I, I, I mean, it's overload. Um, again, the, I, the website is not massive. Like it used to get a lot more traffic. The YouTube channel gets way more traffic now than the website, but I still get a lot of website traffic. I'm getting, I'm back up to almost 2000 a day now, which it had been sliced down to a thousand a day after the WordPress issues a year ago, but now the the website has climbed back up to about two thousand a day, and so I'm getting a lot of messages from the website every day, um, and it's just like, for me, it's very draining. I I hate my emails. I don't hate you guys, but I hate email. It's so draining to go in there and click on all of these emails. And there's literally like, I mean, just from the website, there's at least probably uh, 200 that I haven't got to. And I feel bad because people think I'm ignoring them and they think, oh, you won't talk to me, bro. Uh, it's just, it's just like, I, it's too much, man. It's too much to get to. Um, I need help. Anyway, so just messages from, and that doesn't even count the people who message me on Patreon. It's just like, I can't even keep up with all this. So I'm so sorry, Nathan. I promise I will try to find your email. Um, I'm guessing that you are talking about tutoring. Is that what you wanted to do, Nathan? Um, if, if it's about tutoring, the easiest way is to go through Patreon for tutoring. So uh, uh, Purple Rose Bear, $5. How do I explain to others why the Orthodox Church distinctions have a basis 
have a basis in nationality, Russian, Serbian, Greek, Coptic. Well, in the history of the church, that's how nations got converted, right? So, so Christianity uh, goes back into history further than post-revolutionary nationalism. After the French Revolution, nationalism kind of took on a new uh, post-enlightenment meaning, and it becomes a revolutionary nationalism. The nation state kind of takes on this new sort of deified status, right? I'm a French revolutionary patriot. I'm an American nationalist patriot. Some of those modern nation states also coincide with ancient nation states, and some of them do not. Right? France is an ancient nation, you could say. goes back millennia. America is not. <laughs> so some of the products are not traditional ethno ethnoi nations like we see in the Greek of Matthew 28. Go out and convert the many ethno ethnos so in the early roman empire if you read canon 6 of nicaea for example you'll see that these regions and of the empire these nations were beginning to be converted so that in that sense nations nation states and people groups are orthodox because all of those orthodox countries existed within one imperium and that makes up the ecumenical church so the way that we have the distinctions is partly nations and it's also partly ancient jurisdictional decisions from councils and also languages and liturgy. So that's why there's Russian, Serbian, Greek, etc. But what is supposed to what used to bind them together was partly the imperium in a political sense. But our church is not political, ultimately, so we can exist without the Imperium. We existed before the Imperium, and we can exist after the Byzantine Imperium, Roman Imperium. You have the Russian Imperium. Now that doesn't exist, but you still have the church, because the church exists as an entity that can be connected to those things, but also not intimately dependent on those things. So just because we have symphonia of church and state working together doesn't mean that the church is dependent on the state. Hence why we can exist in places where we're persecuted. So the church is outside of time and space, but it's also in time and space, but it also transcends national boundaries, even though it's incarnate within nation states and national boundaries, just like the incarnation. So the Orthodox Church shares a common belief, the creed. We share common liturgies and scriptures, uh, the faith, traditions right there's some variance in different nations as to language and whatnot but the the beliefs that we have are unified and so we have one holy catholic and apostolic church and we have one creed that we believe all right um jack too how would you define wisdom i would define wisdom the way the bible defines wisdom so wisdom in scripture is the knowledge of god the the fear of the lord proverbs one says is the beginning of wisdom so I would define it in the way Proverbs does. And that's why we don't believe in natural theology or auto autonomous human reasoning as the ultimate ground and foundation. Right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge, Proverbs says. Well, if that's true, then I can't properly interpret the natural world without revealed theology. I can get some things right, but I'm going to ultimately screw up if I don't have revealed theology. That's what Basil says in the Hexameron. Straw Hat, $5. God bless you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Straw Hat. Much appreciated. Welcome. Hopefully this is helpful. Agnostic Kuzamaki, 50 bucks. Wow. That's a big, fat super chat for an Agnostic Kuzumaki. <laughs> hey, Jay. Uh, sorry, this is off topic. I see that you use the transcendental argument a lot for a proof of Christ and appealing to empiricism is flawed. Isn't mentioning the various miracles and historians like Tacitus, a decent empiricist argument. Right, so uh, we don't oppose uh, evidential arguments and claims. They're part of our overall worldview, but we don't use them as our starting point, and that's because no evidentialist claims or empirical claims are brute facts or theory neutral. So we would say that because all facts are theory-laden, they come with an interpretive framework by which you read those facts, it's necessary to understand and argue at a paradigmatic level first 
so that we can then place the evidences within their proper context. So the reason that I wouldn't say, hey, atheist, uh, hey, uh, uh, Tacitus talked about Jesus, so therefore Jesus exists, is because the atheist is going to say, well, yes, yeah, so what? I don't care if some dude named Jesus existed. In other words, just proving the historicity of a guy named Jesus doesn't do anything. Because for us, Jesus only matters and makes sense in the rest of the Christian paradigm. It only matters and makes sense if he was the son of God and if he was raised from the dead, right? But an atheist could just say, well, so what if there was a guy named Jesus? It doesn't mean that he rose from the dead. So in other words, it, within the Christian paradigm, Tacitus is very useful. And so what I'm saying is that miracles or those kinds of claims or historical evidences are useful, but they're only useful if you have the Christian paradigm. Because otherwise, they're not going to be convincing. They're just going to be brushed aside because the atheist has blinders that he reads everything through, right? Like he's got these glasses that he reads everything through of naturalism. And so if you, if you, you spend all day, let's say you prove to an atheist the resurrection. Let's say I spend 10 years proving to an atheist. I stack all these facts up. Hey, it's possible that a guy could be resurrected. Look at this. Hey, look at this historical testimony to a guy that they believe there was. Look at the apostles change their attitude of being wimps to being bold. And then finally, after 10 years, the atheist says, yeah, OK, fine. Guess what? I believe Jesus resurrected. But crazy things happen and none of the rest of Christianity is true. <laughs> right. So that you wasted 10 years. It's just a weak argument. It's weak. It's not a it's not good enough to just prove that a guy was raised from the dead. Elijah. Right. The bones of Elisha. Excuse me. The bones of Elisha. Lazarus. Well, Lazarus was raised from the dead. Is Lazarus God? No. So the resurrection is only significant within the context of the rest of Christianity and the rest of the system in the theology of Christianity. That's why we can't just use these empirical arguments as if they proved anything outside of the context of the rest of Christianity. The resurrection of Christ is a proof of the Christian worldview as a whole if you believe Christianity. Right? If you don't believe Christianity, then resurrections are, well, whatever, crazy stuff happens. Doesn't mean that all Christianity is true. So what you have, so what I'm saying is that you have to get to the basic presuppositions of the atheist system, and that's a much stronger argument because you, you need to not grant to them the autonomy and the neutrality that they think that they have. Their whole system is premised on the assumption of neutrality. Oh, well, we're all just neutrally interpreting facts, and we just stack the facts up, and we analyze the facts, and we see which ones are true or false, and then that's how we make a decision about whether Christianity is true or false. No, no, no. It's not like that. We look at the paradigms because the facts are read through the lens of the paradigm, and then we compare the systems. We compare the atheist paradigm to the Christian paradigm. And we see which of these paradigms is the coherent and which one's nonsense. And invariably, in all cases, the atheist paradigm is total, complete nonsense at a fundamental level. That's a much stronger argument. And then you can talk about the historical evidences. Because, again, history doesn't come to us as brute facts. No fact is a brute fact. Every fact is interpreted in a paradigm, in a system, in a web of beliefs. That's why. So basically, the simple answer to your question is that because we are not classical foundationalists and classical foundationalism doesn't work. Uh, Cairo Libarum, five bucks. What's a good book to read on the canons of the ecumenical councils? Also, what book are you reading the canons of St. Basil from? Well, uh, presently, all we have is the Philip Schaff set. Uh, now, there, Ubi has pointed out, Ubi Petrus, his great blog uh, over at Ubi Petrus, look that up he's been refuting Ibarra uh, extensively here I'll link I'll link Ubi in the stream while we're talking about it uh, I, sh I don't I have it on my phone I don't know if I have it on this uh, computer so if you go to Ubi's blog he's got like these really in-depth super refutations of Ibarra which just totally decimate him. Uh, I'll put that in the chat here if you want to get into the issues with Ibarra and refuting that stuff. And he's also going to be doing some stuff uh, about the canons of the councils and the acts of the councils. So a lot of these acts have not been translated, but some of them are going to be translated soon, uh, like Chalcedon. 
for the first time into English, not just the canons, which are in the shaft set, but the entire axe. OK, so we're looking forward to that. But right now, what we have is the Philip shaft set, which I'm reading the, the basal volume of the, of the Philip, shaft, Philip shaft set earlier. And then the Philip shaft set has a whole volume on the seven ecumenical councils. It has the canons, but it, is, it has a bunch of abridgments uh, in, in regards to the other stuff. So until we get the other English translations of the ecumenical councils, which is going to be great, by the way, uh, right now what we have is the Philip Schaff set. Uh, I don't personally know. I've had mine since 2003, so I don't know if this is out of print, if you can get it now, or I don't know what the status of this set is nowadays. Um, I get this question a lot, so maybe I should just look. I don't know. I don't want to bore you guys with this, but... Uh, Actually, you guys in the chat, can you? Uh, it used to be a thing called Christian Book Distributors. Um, they sold it for three hundred dollars for a long time, and it's like a twelve hundred dollars set. So let's see. If we go to Amazon, we have it is for sale for wow, dude. I should have stacked up on freaking Philip Schaff church father sets back in the day because they were for $300 for years. Oh, I'm talking about all 48, all 38 volumes for $300. Now the whole set is, uh, 1200. So <laughs> now, uh, sometimes you can find used, copies for sale of individual volumes i've seen that before so you might can find a used volume of the shaft set otherwise you have to go to new advent right so if you go to new advent the catholic site uh what's at new advent is the, the shaft set so uh, uh, as for right now that's the best that we have that i know of uh, there may be some translations that i don't know about Uh, and by the way, don't always trust Amazon. Like Amazon sells the um, debate with a barley mite for $300. But if you go to SNUI Press, it's 20 bucks. So uh, let's see if it's on. Um, I don't even know if Christian book distributors exist anymore. Does that still exist? Christian book distributors. Yes, it looks like it does still exist. The light is blinding. All right, is it out of print? Let's see. Hmm. I don't see it coming up on CBD. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. Metropolitan Ralph Groy for five bucks. How would you respond to Ukrainian schismatics who have been asking for autocephaly since the nineties? I've seen a lot of pro EP gaslighting. Uh, just respond by reading all the stuff at ortho Christian pointing out how this is all just a motivated motivation of the CIA, NATO, and the state department it has nothing to do ultimately with canons of ancient councils. It's totally, uh, politically motivated. That's it. It's that simple. I like none of this. Like, all these people, oh, the Cajun canon, this, uh, none of that matters if Bartholomew's a heretic and it's prompted by the State Department. Who cares about what all these ancient canons said if the motivation for is, is totally geopolitical? It doesn't matter. That's what I would say. Uh, and by the way, there's plenty of documentation of that at orthochristian.com. Um, Z, unity, five bucks. God is bigger than any church. Religion is a bunch of hallucin hallucinations. Whoa, dude, woke take there. I love you, Jay. You're a great teacher. I owe you more. God bless. Now, wait a minute. Who is the God that's blessing me if religion is a bunch of hallucinations? So have I hallucinated the God? Did you hallucinate the God that blessed me? Z? I mean, I thank you for your five bucks, but I'm going to have to precept this contradictory uh, super chat here because, uh, by the way, if religion is a bunch of hallucinations, then I'm not a great teacher. I'm actually just spewing out hallucination, hallucination nonsense. So thank you for your super chat, but I'm going to have to precept it as total nonsense. Uh, Jethro Tull, 10 bucks. Congrats on 45,000. Oh yeah. Thank you everybody. We're here finally, even though 
our growth has been algorithmically damaged in the last couple months. Uh, we're still, still thankfully growing slower, but uh, we have hit 45. So I would ask everybody too, please uh, share the stuff because I don't know what is algorithmically going on, but it really would help me if you share my videos and share the videos about, you know, Star Wars and all that crap too. Uh, these top 10 videos did really well. People seem to really like those. We got quite a few new subscribers from all those top tens. So if you would, please share those around guys. It would help me out a lot. Maybe we can like get over this algorithm hump here. That's slowing things a bit. And if you would help me reach 50 K, we'll have a big, uh, fun stream with our friends and allies. When we hit the 50 K mark, Lord willing, if we do. And then of course, yes, the goal is to get to the big 100. I think we can do it. Now, our, our, again, our growth has been slowed. We've had some road bumps. Uh, I did get a unfortunate uh, strike related to something ridiculous about a thumbnail. Uh, it had nothing to do with community guidelines. It was to do with movies, which is really annoying because there are zillion channels with thumbnails that have movie people in them. But that strike has expired so i'm free from thumbnail strikes so stupid to get a thumbnail strike uh so hopefully now maybe maybe i don't know if that copyright was slowing things a little bit but that's gone now so maybe we can like get back into the like thrust the algorithm thrust now that we're not under any copyrights from a thumbnail um and maybe we can uh speed ahead towards 100. Now, again, yes, if I had a debate, I feel like if I could get Stefan to debate, and this is why I want to appeal to Stefan in a nice way, I don't want to attack you or, or take you down. I don't view it that way. Ultimately, we want you to be orthodox, and we want all those people to become orthodox. Like that's It's a labor of love. We're not here to make enemies. We want people to be our friends. We all want to be on the same team because we want to bring everybody to orthodoxy. That's our motives. Uh, but now if I was able to have a chat with Stefan, dude, I could probably get right to 100,000. So I would really like to have that chat with Stefan. I think a lot of people would be uh, drawn in our direction. It would grow the channel. That's just the personal selfish motives. I mean, obviously, that's not what it's ultimately about getting numbers on YouTube, but we do want to get to 100. I want that 100 is the goal. I think it's within uh, reach within the next couple of years. Hopefully, if our growth uh, curve stays the same, we've gone from three to 45, 3,000 to 45 in what, three and a half years? That's pretty good. So let's get to uh, 50 in the next two, or excuse me, in the next, say, I'm going to say uh, next few months, we'll hit 50. And then If we can, if we can get the growth curve up, I would say we could hit a hundred, depending on who, what shows and big events we get, maybe in a, in two years, maybe best case scenario, two years, a hundred might take three or four. If, if the growth is slow and if we don't get uh, the algorithmic promotion, like we want part of that will depend, you know, on where YouTube goes. So, you know, keep, keep messaging, keep telling stuff on, he needs to have a chat. It doesn't have to be a, a, a blood sports we can have a friendly civil discussion that would help me out a lot um we let's so what else so we got the big debate with ijaz the muslim coming up that could be some good traction sticks says he wants to do a debate so we're gonna have a debate with sticks um an like another one we we had a halfway debate at the time, because he wasn't really willing to do a debate, but now, but so now I think he does want to do a debate. So that could be some good traction, because he's grown quite a bit since our last debate. Uh, and then there was one other big debate. Who was the other big possibility? Anyway, it's always a good thing when we get the bigger, the big, big, big name, bigger people too be willing to do it. That's so you want to be friendly with the big name people. Cause if you piss them off, they'll be like, screw you. You know, you need me, <laughs> right? Like I don't need you, but you need my audience. Uh, you know, that kind of a thing. So, you know, we'll see, pray for it. Pray for uh, big, big debates. We'll see.
Oh, Mediker. Mediker said he wanted to do a stream. Uh, yeah, I'm here to reach out. I can do that. I can help. But thank you, Jethro. Much appreciated. Jethro, been here for a long time. Big time supporter. Shout out to Jethro Tull. Let's get on the way to 100K. Everyone appreciates your content. We need a Jadar Nick Cage deep fake as soon as possible. Yeah, please, somebody please make a uh, Nick Cage deep fake. It would be great. Hot soda, 50 bucks. Damn, son. Angel of Wrath. Yeah, I just I commented on James White in the first uh, 10 minutes of the stream. What is your method of reading and taking notes? Uh, now, I get this question a lot, and uh, I hope to – I know you gave 50 bucks, so I don't want to disappoint you. But it is not a very methodical approach. For example, uh, there's not like color-coded meaning to the different <laughs> uh, sticky notes. So it's very simple, actually. Now, I will say this. Uh, I somewhat regret that I wrote in all my books. Now, from a practical knowledge standpoint, I don't regret it because writing in and underlining helped me to absorb it. So that's part of the reason why I can remember this tremendous amount of stuff is that I really, it helps me to visually underline stuff. The downside of this is that I didn't realize in 2003 that a lot of these books, even if they are paperback, could be worth something. <laughs> so I have thousands of books, a lot of those books I wrote in. So that decreases the value. So if you're going to be like a book collector kind of person, uh, I wouldn't write in my books. However, perhaps if you're going to be famous one day <laughs> and you wrote in your books and you wrote all over everything, you, it'll be even, I don't know, maybe it'll be worth more that way, perhaps. But if you don't want to write on the pages, the, what I do, this is the best method I have found, is that I buy the sticky notes. I only like the ones that are a specific size. They have to be this size because I can write on that size and they don't cover up a huge chunk of the page. That really gets on my nerves when it's those big sticky notes that cover up the page. So what I do is I will underline and nowadays I underline less in books because books are expensive and uh, I don't want to devalue the book by writing in it. But what I do is what's on that page, I will basically sort of summarize in a sticky note if it's an important thing. And that is the easiest way I've found. Because then when you look at the book, you're like, uh, you don't have to flip through. Sometimes I do this sort of collation at the beginning if it's like an important work for apologetics like this is. Uh, but typically I'm not going to do that in every book. I'm not going to have like a list of, you know, citations at the beginning of the book. I'm just going to put the sticky note in the pertinent page and summarize what's on that page on the sticky note. Uh, and eventually, if you get used to this, you will not be able to read a book without your pencil or your pen. But it will literally feel, you can't do it, like you'll feel incomplete. You'll, you'll have your book and you'll be like, I cannot start reading until I get my pen. Where's my pen? And so the pen will literally have to be in your hand. I'm, I'm serious. That's how it is. After 20 years of this, that's how it is. So the, the, the pen's got to be there. I can make do without the sticky note because I can write in the book usually. And since most of my books are written in, it doesn't matter. Might as well just keep writing in them. Uh, so that's how I do it. Yeah, there's no method. Uh, I mean, there's a little bit of a method of marks that I use. Uh, I do the, there's a circle around a P if it's something to relate to presuppositions. Um, if it's to relate to, I don't know, atheism or something like that, I might do an A or I'll write atheism or, you know, I'll, I'll write letters next to, in the margins related. Like here, you know, I wrote that this is dealing with the logi and the archetypes, you know, so, so that's how I do it. But if you were expecting like some really organized thing, it's not, I'm not organized at all when it comes to this stuff. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Uh, but you know, that's just kind of, I probably have some kind of degree of autism. I'm probably, I don't even know for sure. I've never been diagnosed, but I was listening to videos of what it is, and I was like, oh, that might be me. So <laughs> maybe that's why I do this the way I do. I don't know. Uh, Nicodemus, the Pharisee, $2. Did Abraham use mental reservation? Is it okay? This is, okay, I, I don't want to get into a huge thing because I don't believe that the Roman Catholic argument of justified lying is legitimate because it opens up a Pandora's box for them to do it in a Talmudic way. 
but I don't believe, I also don't believe that deception is always wrong. I do believe there are justified instances of deception. For example, uh, if I think Augustine even, so if I recall, Augustine is against all instances of deception. And I've never seen this position as biblical. There's multiple cases in the Old Testament of righteous people engaging in righteous deception. Now, I believe that's different than willful, malicious lying. Okay, so if somebody is in your, uh, if the secret police are coming to kill somebody unjustly, and you hide them in your basement, and you say, nope, nobody's here, I'm sorry, but that's a justified instance of deception. I believe that it is. I believe there's multiple biblical instances of this. So, I, but I don't think that's the same thing, even though sometimes Roman Catholic Alfonso Liguori people will use instances like that of justified lying. In the Roman Catholic system, it actually is this weird thing that morphs into uh, like even lying in terms of theology or it, it's related to the mortal venial sin stuff. It, it just goes crazy if you read Alfonso Liguori on it. So I'm not been, uh, advocating for that stuff, but I will say that I do believe, contrary to Augustine, that there are uh, cases and instances of uh, justified deception. Now, this has been debated in the history of Christianity, so you'll find a lot of people debating it both ways, uh, but that's my take on it. And again, for me, the ultimate authority is not uh, canonical disputes. Uh, it's not Latin theologian, moral theolo theology disputes. For me, the ultimate uh, authority on this is divine revelation. And I'm going to say the same thing when it comes to questions. Uh, I'm not going to say these things, but we've had disputes on this in the Discord over what's allowed between married couples. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, again, for me, the final uh, arbiter on that is not the opinion of so-and-so, but divine revelation. So I'll say the same thing for uh, justified deception. I do think there's cases for it. That doesn't mean I'm saying that it's a Pandora's box and you can do whatever you want in some Jesuit type thing. I don't believe in that. So, uh, you, are a serp you are a serper, $5. If atheists believe in relativism and also critique things like slavery in the Bible's proof that God is immortal, immoral, then wouldn't slavery be relative? If atheists believe in relativism, but they also critique slavery in the Bible as proof God's immoral, then wouldn't slavery be relative? I think you're saying that they don't have a basis to uh, morally critique it, and I would agree. Yes. So you're basically using a kind of a transcendental argument against the atheist because they're relativists, right? So if morals are relative and subjective, then you can't really critique God in any sense of being immoral. Correct. Absolutely. I think that's what you're saying. Uh, if I'm misunderstanding you and you're saying, is God immoral and do morals evolve then you can correct me but uh if i understand you correctly i would agree william uh petter 20 pounds i've been convinced by intellectual arguments for orthodoxy i'm hoping to convert however last summer i went to a charismatic event where i had a religious experience of sorts what should i make of this well i would say that um the way that so charismaticism as a movement is completely out of accord with the Bible and out of accord with the history of religious tradition of the church. It's a 1900 Azusa Street in California crazy thing. And it's not what the history of the church has meant by speaking in tongues. That's actual languages. It's not what's been meant by uh, angelic prayer. That's actually noetic prayer or hesychasm, the prayer of the noose. That's what Paul's talking about. That's all orthodox stuff. It's not flopping around on the ground, around, barking, rolling around, acting like dogs. I'm not saying that's what happened to you. And also our subjective experiences, like a religious experience, our tradition warns against those, not because they're always wrong, but because we can easily be deceived and led into prelest. Prelest is the mistake that is especially true of a lot of converts. And again, I'm not trying to call you out or impugn your motives. I don't know your motives. I don't know you personally. So I'm just speaking from uh, what our tradition says on these things, which is that we use extreme caution when it comes to uh, so-called uh, spiritual experiences, only because we can be easily deceived, especially as a new convert, because Paul says, beware of ordaining new converts because they can be puffed up. 
So we have to be very careful that we don't mistake our uh, emotional experiences or even the sincerity of our experiences with God speaking to us. Our heart, the heart is very deceptive, right, and tricky, uh, Jeremiah says. So we have to be careful, and that's why the Scripture says that the, the ultimate test for spiritual experiences even is divine revelation itself, right? So all the way from Deuteronomy, the test for a prophet is that he has to speak in unison with Scripture. Paul repeats this Deuteronomy test for prophecy or prophets or teachers that they have to speak in line with the tradition of the apostles. And we believe that the canon is closed. There's no new revelations. There's no new public oracles. Revelation has ceased. Now, in the church, we do believe there's miracles. So there have been saints who are clairvoyant. There have been people who have experienced miraculous things, but that's not the same thing as public revelation, right? No saint can come and say, I, Bishop of Ephesus, have received new revelation from God that there should be a new book of the scriptures. Uh, we will call it uh, Saint Me, and we will add it to the text of Revelation because God spoke to me. Until that's totally impossible in our, in our view. Will not and cannot happen, right? But that doesn't mean that God can't give a person a mystical kind of direct Revelation. Orthodoxy does affirm that in the sense of our experiential uh, theology of the news, you could say. But that is still not divorced from the public context of the church, the tradition of the church, the rules and guidelines of the church, and the warnings of our spiritual fathers. So what you need in that equation is a spiritual father, because a spiritual father is going to help you not fall into pre list and not be misled. This is why another reason why it's totally nonsense for people to call the stuff that we do cultic or that my discord is a cult. All we do is tell people that they need to find a spiritual father and be under a canonical church. So that's crazy. So I would say the same thing to you. Uh, there's a great essay that helped me a long time ago when I read it about 10 year, years ago when I was first looking into this question. Let's see. Uh, there's one of the Orthodox bishops... And I think it deals with dreams. It's a, it's a warning about dreams. And it's not saying that dreams are inherently bad. It's just warning us that we can be deceived and led into pre lest on the basis of them. There's a really good article. I don't know if I'll ever find that again. I might have, I think I saved it in my pocket on my phone. I'll still never find it. There's like a hundred things in there. Um, anyway, you get the point. I'll never find that article, but uh, that's what I would say. Uh, white top two dollars. Is that the last one? Oh, and an angel of wrath. Yeah, we covered James White in the first ten minutes. By the way. Uh, about 100 people have messaged me, when are you going to debate James White? We already tried to set up a debate with James White like six months ago, and he declined. And he said, I don't have time to research Orthodox Christianity. I don't have time for that. Uh, so he's not going to, He again, he, that's not going to happen. He's not going to debate me. <laughs> Julius Evola is in hospital. <laughs> that's funny. Yes, uh, the village people. He's one of the village people. Macho, ma. Macho man. Macho, macho over man. <laughs> All right. I think I've spent, I think I've spent y'all. So the next couple of days, uh, we'll have part two. It will cover Genesis 22, 23. And uh, thank you all. Great questions tonight. Hopefully that was helpful to everybody. God bless. Uh, I hope that's a joke. Bro, why don't you debate James White? Like, I've covered that like 20 times in the last three days. Bro, when you're going to bed, James, what? Yeah, typically we ignore our dreams. Now, I would say that the, even the fathers who say ignore dreams admit that God can speak to us in dreams. If, if God so chose, like we can't, we're not going to be like Pharisees, be like God doesn't do that. He can never do that. God can do that. But we typically don't go by that or pay attention to it because we can be deceived. Right. So we, we, we have that as a caution there. And that's very important. 
Uh, that's why we are not charismatics. And by the way, uh, go listen to my talk on Father Seraphim Rowe's Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future because he has a significant critique of the charismatic movement in that talk. Uh, so if you look up on YouTube, Jay Dyer, uh, Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future, very popular talk. It's had about 20,000 views. You can go watch that, where, and it covers significantly the charismatic deception. Uh, not saying that everybody who goes to a charismatic church is evil. Like it's it, it, People don't know what they're getting involved in. And it's just a bunch of emotionalism. So uh, fresh whole milk, $3, three A's. Will you debate my brother? Absolutely. Tell your brother to bring it on. I'll debate your sister too. <laughs> All right, everybody have a good night.